get to actually editing them. All right, so here's a few news articles. Let me try and fit them on my screen better. Okay, so uh, these scooters are all the rage, but people are getting hurt a lot. So you gotta wear a helmet at least. And I think a lot of emergency room visits are for broken wrists and all sorts of things, but certainly hitting your head is the main risk. Um, but they're very, very popular. These guys say that flu vaccines are not good enough and they can make them better. Now, I would really like it if that happened. I'm a real fan of the flu vaccine, but it only works about 50% of the time. And they claim they have figured out what the problem is and they're going to make a better flu vaccine. So more power to them. I hope it works. This is great science fiction. This is a completely artificial life form. They took frog cells and turned it into a living robot. So, uh, this sounds awesome. And so this thing can like sort of crawl around by wiggling these little feet. Here's the geometrical diagram of how it walks. And here's a, a yep, path walking through this stuff, leaving those trails. So you've got little creepy robots. So in, in about 300 years, we'll have aliens. So. Or dinosaurs. Yeah, the dinosaurs. Or, or the one thing that's been one of the standards, um, in science fiction for decades is anti-cancer bots, the size of molecules. If you could send things in your body that would be like artificial white blood cells to kill just the cancer and nothing else, it would be awesome. But of course, it'll probably be like a Tesla and kill the wrong thing for a while at first, but you know. Um, so I thought this was pretty fun. I, I'm, we're gonna do iOS this time in the mobile device hacking class because of one of my students, Axiom X, who cracked iPhone security three months ago and made it so we can now get inside the iOS, which we have not been able to do for about eight years. So now we can totally get inside apps and see how they work. And so I started auditing apps. I've audited about 400 apps starting around Christmas. And um, when I do them, I have to notify the vendor and give them time to fix it. But some vendors are so considerate as to just tell me to go away, in which case they volunteer to become homework quickly. So rate my professor, a company you probably heard of. If you haven't, you should be reading the reviews of professor before you take classes around here. You probably figured that out by now. But anyway, their app has a security problem. Now, it's not a terribly important security problem, but it's technically a security problem. If you install the app on your iPhone and then you log in, it stores your password locally in the cache. Now, it doesn't deliberately store it in a configuration file, which some apps do, but it does cache it, and that is technically something you should not do because it could be stolen from your phone. So I told them, I went to their comment page and told them, and they quickly replied saying, we will not click the link. Um, we don't know what you're talking about. Tell us who, what kind of customer you are and all that. This is when you don't have any security team at all. And whoever gets reports, when you see security problem, they just say, I don't know what security is. I never heard of that. If you're not a customer, just get lost, which is handy. Otherwise, I have to wait 30 days for them to do nothing. But then that, the other, that volunteered to be homework. So anyway, they'll probably be homework in the class or someone else. I've got a lot of vulnerable ones. And uh, anyway, we'll be hacking into those. Uh, so Uber, California passed a law to make Uber drivers employees. So Uber immediately protested and said they're innocent. Their app just connects drivers to passengers and the drivers are not their employees. And they don't have to pay them. But now they're modifying the pricing of their uh, service just to make sure they do not fall within the parameters of the law. And this is what, you know, the unintended consequences. Whenever you pass a law, everybody adjusts their business to pass through the loophole, especially tax laws and such. So anyway, that's, um, we'll see how this all comes out. But Uber is, of course, very, very, very afraid of having to consider their drivers employees and give them benefits, just like everybody in tech is very, very, very afraid of unions. I've been waiting for 30 years for coders unions, network administrators unions, if there's any business where people work long hours, get fired arbitrarily, get, get abused, it's tech, and somehow they never form a union because there's been this macho hero thing going on. At some point, it's going to get mature enough that they'll form a union, and now there's a lot of scandals about Facebook and Google firing people for daring to talk about forming unions. Anyway, it seems inevitable that within a few years we'll have tech unions, but maybe not. Anyway, this is actually a big, big issue. If you take medications, they change your personality in really big ways. I knew a uh, one of the security women on Twitter was talking about how she left for a conference and her husband committed suicide. And then she found out it was a known side effect of the drug he was taking that makes you suicidal, which is a fairly common side effect of mood elevators and other drugs. And a lot of them have amazing side effects like compulsive gambling and compulsive sexual activity totally from a relatively benign drug for another thing. And what they're showing is statins that lower 
your cholesterol tend to make people aggressive and violent. And so it turns out a lot of these drugs have serious psychological side effects, which have not been understood. And it's uh, an important issue. So anyway, it's, it's a thing to know about. I don't happen to my sister. She was taking something and it had a big effect on her mood and she had to quit taking it. It's um, an antibiotic, I think, caused depression. It's, uh, people have not been thinking about the psychological consequences of the drugs, but they are there. Anyway, now we're officially at the time here. So this is the CISSP class. I think most of you have taken my classes before and you know how things go. Uh, if anybody wants a paper handout explaining the grading, I've got one here. Um, I didn't make as many copies of the people because I found out almost nobody takes them. Uh, it's all pretty simple, but I will talk about what's going on here. So the point of this is to get the CISSP certification. Now, many students will probably not want to get it right away because it's very expensive. It costs about $660 for the test, um, but it is the most important information security certification for most people. However, the, um, the technical red teamers are always very, very angry about the CISSP because it is not a technical exam. What it is, is a management exam. And the point of it is to show that you know how to cooperate with management, which as you can imagine is real important in the real job. That's why people really want you to have it. So it is the classic thing about the CISSP is it is a mile wide and an inch deep. You do not have any hands-on training at all. There are no hands-on projects. You don't know any depth of anything. You just know all the terms because the point is not that you're going to be the hands-on person doing something. You're going to be the manager deciding which product to buy and which technology to invest in. So you're supposed to know generally what everything does without all the details, which the very hands-on technical people complain a lot that this is useless. And, you know, as I get older and move more into management, I begin to appreciate it more and more. This is actually a big deal. To drive the ship requires well, I used to be the hands-on technical guy at an escrow agency, and I was always frustrated at the boss because he didn't want to hear my technical explanations. And it took me a long time to realize that my job was to take the technical group and boil it down to actionable business intelligence. He didn't want to hear, here's the binary, here's the code I read. He wanted to hear, look, here's what we can do. Here's how much it will cost. Here's how long it will take. And here's what it will do for us. And if we don't do it, we'll have to do this. And here's how long that would take and how much that would cost. Now, I thought that was ridiculous. Why should I worry about things like that? But that's what he needed because he was trying to steer the ship. And that he trusts me to wade through the binary gobbledygook to boil it down to what should we do and how much will it cost, which is really what my purpose is, is to transmute baffling technical babble into actionable business decisions. But I didn't understand that for a while. I became much more effective when I learned that. Anyway, um, so there will be quizzes. The quizzes are online. They are on my Canvas server. Uh, this is at samsclass.info. The only thing you need, everything is always online. You don't need to come to class physically. You can connect by Zoom. The Zoom is running now and hopefully recording. I remember to start the recording. I did, good. And so some four people are already coming in remotely. You can attend remotely. And I put them on YouTube later. So you can watch them on YouTube if you want to later. You do not need to come to class and you don't even need to connect with the live Zoom if you don't want to. Um, you don't get any points by showing up and you don't lose any points by not showing up. The grading is based entirely on quizzes and term papers and uh, presentations. Each of you have to make two, there's online quizzes, do every week or two, um, which you take online in the Canvas system, and then you have to do two papers and two presentations. This is what I did last semester in my CASM class, and I think it was very successful, especially because students were so very afraid of it. Many students dropped the class immediately when they found out they have to give presentations, write papers, because that shows how much they need it. The papers are not long, like two pages. They don't I have any kind of security topic is all right. I just want it to make a clear statement in proper grammatical English. I want it to be up to normal business standards. It doesn't have to be in exact whatever that uh, official SLA format for references or anything. I don't even know it. I just want it to be good enough that you could use it on the job to communicate. Some, and same thing, presentations are like lightning talks. Four minutes in class or remotely on Zoom or YouTube, you present something on a security topic. Two presentations and two papers. Um, because if, if you can do it, it should be easy. If you have trouble communicating in writing or speech, then I want you to work on that. That is super important. You can't get anywhere in business if you can't communicate in writing and communicate in a brief presentation. So you need to practice that, um, and that's the point of this. So uh, there's the schedule. Uh, next week, class will meet an hour late because there is a job fair. If you need a job, you should come to this. Um, 
this is quite a big deal now. We've been doing it for several years and we now have a lot of loyal uh, employers that come to this thing. So it'll be uh, five to seven next week. Or January 27th is next week, isn't it? Two weeks, all right. Anyway, on 27th, go to that if you want a job. We had about 13 employers at the last one, had about 100 or 100, more than 100 students and like 50 of them got a job right on the spot. Some of them are volunteer, uh, quite a few of them pay. And they have all different requirements. Some of them don't require much of anything and you're gonna be refurbishing old computers. Some people want help designing websites. Some people want you to write code in Python or something. Uh, NCC has been coming and they wanna hire serious pen testers. So they want you to be very sharp about hacking into websites and all kinds of things are there. So I highly recommend showing up if you're interested in hunting and finding a job or a better job or just seeing what's required to get a job. Anyway. Um, all right, so that's, there's the schedule. So you have to turn in a topic by a certain date and then you have to perform your presentation. If you do it early, you get some extra points. If you do it late, you lose some points. And uh, the same, and there's time in the paper to do. So are there any questions about anything? Okay, that stuff adds up to a bunch of points and like 90% is an A and 80% is a B and so on, just like all my other classes. Yeah. When, oh, they're all up there now. You can do all the quizzes anytime. Um, so you go to this Canvas server and you sign up with this link. Anybody can join. Um, by the way, anybody in the world can take this course. They don't have to be in City College. Canvas does not let you in. Oh, oh, that's not right. Well, I'll check it. Okay, maybe it's not published yet or something. Uh, well, let's see if it works for me. Well, it does work for me, so that's rude. Um, Do you have to enroll in the course? Yeah, but that should take you to the enrollment link. Let me open a private window and see on a private window with no cookies. And now if I go here, yeah, I don't get access denied. So I, I get right there, I can enroll. That's what you should see. You should be able to click that link. And then if you already have an account on this server, you can get in otherwise, but you do have to enroll in the course. Um, now maybe you went to this one. Okay, you have to enroll first. So go to this link first to enroll in the course. And then you, the old quizzes are up there. You can take them. Uh, whenever you want to, but there's a due date. And if you take them after the due date, you lose some points for being late. That's all. And you get two choices, two chances to take each quiz, the usual stuff. All right. So let me um, start by telling you the essence of the CISSP. So I think I'll start with this one. Um, so this is the, tonight we're not going to be covering the eight domains. We're just going to cover what the CISSP is and why you might care. So here's the point. Um, that's what we're going to do is, is go through the basic concept in the CISSP and students will have presentations and papers and you may want to get practice exams or you may want to do that later. Um, anyway, everything is here. Sam's class info at the 125 page. Everything I do in class goes up there. That's where the videos will go. Um, and that's where Canvas is not the City College Canvas server. It's on my own Canvas server. Um, because I want, I'm doing stuff that they wouldn't let me do. I'm just letting the whole world in, for example. Anybody in every, all, all kinds of random people from all over the world are just grand, are joining the course and I don't care. So, but I couldn't do that on the city college server because they have rules and stuff. So anyway, um, so this is the main certification in information security. Everyone expects you to have it. I know a guy that has 25 certifications and the only thing on his business card is CISSP. It's all anybody cares about. Now, if you're technical, you brought things like OSCP and CCIE, and that's fine, but almost everyone expects you to have a CISSP, especially if you're a security consultant, because the main point of it is we can trust you. You are gonna obey the rules, you're gonna understand confidentiality and cooperating and management and legal agreements and all that jazz. Um, so there's tons of records showing people make a pile of money with this. Uh, you typically only, you move into management with the CISSP is the point. You don't normally expect your help desk people, your IT people to have it, but as they move up into management, they're expected to have it. It's important for compliance with government, with uh, military jobs, government jobs, and uh, all the industries that have to be compliant with all the various compliances. It's uh, often quite useful for your staff to have certifications. This is one of the main ones. Uh, it gives you government information assurance. Um, all right. You need five years of experience to get it, although you can get one or two years wait for other things like a degree and some other certifications. It's $700 now, it's three hours, it used to be six hours when I took it, and uh, you have to, you're held by the ethics. That's why most students don't take it right away because that's a lot of money. 
you often want to wait for your boss to pay for it, but that's a strategic decision. I took the pain for my own certification because the college doesn't cough up anything. And I realized I'm an independent contractor. The college is one of my clients. Making myself more valuable is an investment in my own career. And I have other clients, more and more other clients aside the college. So I don't want to ever be held back by the stinginess of my college. So I highly recommend in this business, not letting anybody hold you back, especially since nobody has any loyalty anymore. People typically jump job every two years or so. So considering yourself to be owned by a company and controlled by the company is probably not a winning technique. I gave that up years ago. I just, I'm an independent contractor and the college is just one of my clients. So I've got my own path and I don't wait for them. In fact, often they're too slow to approve new courses around here. So I just teach them elsewhere. DEF CON, uh, other conferences. I teach a new class at other colleges that are less slow and wait for them to catch up here. Anyway, so uh, if you take the test and pass it, but you don't have the five years of experience, you gain associate of ISC squared, which means you have this credential, which is not a full CISSP, but it means you passed the test. Now you have six years to accumulate the experience. And then all you have to do is turn in documents about the experience and you become a CISSP. That's what I did. When I did it, they did not regard teaching as valuable experience. So I didn't have the experience. So I took the test but they regarded curriculum development and writing new courses as significant. So I eventually managed to convince them I had enough experience and get in. There was also an issue of ethics, which I'll talk about. Um, there's another one here, an SSCP, which is sort of half of a CISSP. That's another way you can go if you want to, a halfway up. Same thing's true of Cisco. There's CCNA and there's a sort of halfway up. Um, there's a bunch of other certifications here too, uh, software security, and I think one for privacy and so on. Healthcare. There's a bunch of other ones available, but the CISSP is the main one everyone gets. Um, and that's the one we're headed for here. CompTIA is a academic group that makes A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+, plus, and those are very greatly respected. And they have about a dozen others. CompTIA makes these things every couple of years. Almost all of them are worthless. They put them up. They had one like INET+, plus. after a couple of years, everyone gives up. Nobody cares. They had Server+, plus, Linux+, plus. and they have half of a CISSP for some reason called CISP. This has been they're all the rage everywhere. People have been pushing this, teaching it. I refused to teach. They wanted to hire me to teach this. And I said, I think it's garbage. I'll teach CISSP instead. And that's what I did. But anyway, this is an option. You hear a lot of teachers talk about this. CISSP is too hard. This is easier for the students. You can see what you think. In my opinion, it's not that hard because the CISSP is about four classes worth of material. But the first three classes are A plus and net plus. You have to know the basics of hardware and the basics of networking, which I hope you already do. You're going through the CNET program. Then you have to learn about that much management on top of it. So if you come from a computer networking curriculum and you already know Net Plus and Security Plus, then all you have to learn is one course for the management. And that's what we're going to do here to finish. The reason why people are scared of it is because they start from an MBA. There are management people who are not technical at all, who want to become a CSSP, and they have to learn A plus and net plus, which is like three courses worth of stuff. So it is greatly feared. They find it an overwhelming lot of material. You got to learn all the protocols and all the IP addressing and subnetting and all this baffling stuff. But most of us, I hope, already know that. If you don't, you should go take A plus and net plus here and make sure you know that stuff. Um, anyway, so... That's the game. That CISP is their attempt to make it easier. I don't think it needs to be easier. You'll see, this is not any more than normal amount of material in the course, in my opinion. I found it a little hard because management was very strange to me. I've never worked at a big corporation, so I really couldn't keep all the different levels of corporate executives straight. I had to sort of memorize them, but I eventually got it, but it was hard for me. It was a weird way to think. I think that's how they feel when they hit like subnetting and they're an MBA, they're like, stuff is baffling. Anyway. Here's a bunch of other CompTIA ones out there, all sorts of things, Cloud Plus and CISA Plus and so on. So some of these might be all right, but a lot of them uh, will probably just vanish after a couple of years. They do have a brand new one from CompTIA called Pentest Plus. And I just looked at the curriculum and it looked really very good. And I'm thinking maybe we should connect our pen testing courses, 123 and 124. Maybe they should go to that cert. Right now they go vaguely in the direction of Certified Ethical Hacker. But Certified Ethical Hacker has a really bad reputation. Is not very good. I think this there's a need for a proper low-level pen testing cert, and that might be a place where CompTIA can actually add some value. But we'll see. Anyway, um, all right. So the code of ethics I mentioned. Do you have to you have to agree to this to become a CISSP, and you have to remain obeying this to keep your CISSP. 
And here's the four rules. You protect society and the Commonwealth. You are, if you are a rebel and you want to tear down society and leak all the things and, and destroy the government, then you shouldn't be getting a CSSP because the whole point of a CSSP is you are going to become part of the government system, part of the military, part of the government, part of the insurance companies, the banks. You're part of what holds the system up as it is. If you are a rebel, you don't logically want to get this certificate or get the kind of job it leads you to. Uh, then, of course, you have to have standard business ethics um, where you do not pretend to do services that you are not competent to do. You don't overcharge people. You don't lie about the quality of your service. You know, the same thing a, a contractor might have. And then you have to advance and protect the profession. You have to do something beyond what you get paid for. You have to have an education requirement, uh, 20 or 40 hours a year or something like that. You have to do continuing education and you have to do something to help others. Um, give talks at a conference, uh, sponsor other people coming up in the profession. There's the same thing the lawyers do and doctors. You're supposed to do something to help the profession and help the new people in. These are all modeled after the bar requirements of lawyers or doctors. So anyway, Preparing for the exam, uh, this class is not enough to prepare for the exam. One book is not enough. This is true of every certification exam. I always go through two whole books, or a course and a book, or a book and a practice test. You have to go through the material twice, in my opinion, to be confident walking into an exam. And when you're paying $700 for the exam, you really don't want to flunk it. So anyway, um, you can. what I did was I taught a course like this out of a textbook a couple of times, and then I went through the transgender practice test, which is by far the best. And then I passed the exam very easily. I, there were like 600 questions or something. There were only 10 I was not 100% sure of. And the transgender practice test is not equal to the test questions. You're not just memorizing answers. You're just practicing until you really know the topics. So I felt like the practice test was very fair and very effective. So I highly recommend it. There are cheaper practice tests, but they are much inferior. Uh, one thing very strange about the CISSP exam is the test is spectacularly unfair. If you take the Net Plus or Security Plus exam, it's just like a college exam. There's a question like, how do you subnet this network? And there's one right answer. The other answers are wrong. It's the way it ought to be. And if you know what's in the book, you'll get it right. The CISSP questions are baffling and frustrating. They will have a vague question that you can't understand, and then a bunch of answers, and all the answers are wrong. And you're supposed to choose the one that is the least stupid of the available choices. Now, a lot of people had a theory in the early days that the guys writing this test are just idiots, but it never changed. And I think the point is they are trying to simulate the real world of management. You have these decisions to make and you really don't have enough information. Anyway, it's, um, you have to really get a practice test and practice it. It is very different than other exams you'll take. It's not, you have to get used to this weird way. It's very much like the way Dilbert's boss is. You have weird questions that, state things wrong and the answers are really strange and uh, you just have to practice and get used to these exams. It seems spectacularly unfair. Anyway, um, there's, there's people that write books about this, the seven types of hard questions and how to approach them. I just found practicing the practice test is what did it for me. But it is very strange. It's very different than a technical exam where it's like math. There is average one answer that's 100% right, the others are 100% wrong. It's not that way at all. It's like one is 70% right, the other is only 30% right. That's about how it is. So you gotta get the one that's 70% right? You have to pick the best answer. That's right. Anyway, so uh, this is the, the Dilbert focus on This is the way management stuff is. They just work hard to make everything as hard to understand as possible. It seems that way. Anyway, um, all right, so. We should uh, we consider this. How many people want to take the exam right away? One there, only one. Okay, I often have, often I have four or five people want to take it right away. I have people that are, have a job, they have a deadline coming up and so on. Anyway, we'll see. Anyway, there's, um, this is the one, the transgender practice exam. If you want a practice exam, I highly recommend getting this one. It costs something like 150 bucks for a month of access. You can get them for free and they're totally worthless. You can get $50 ones. And they're really stupid. Like they'll have a poorly asked question. They won't even tell you. The point about this one is it has a very good question and it has four answers. And the answer page tells you why the right answer is right. And it tells you exactly why each of the others is wrong. And the way to use this is not just to get the right answer, but to make sure you understand every term you see in every answer, even the wrong answers. And if there's anything you don't know, you stop and Google it and study it. Read it in the textbook until you know every term on the page and keep practicing until you do that. That is how you learn. 
because it doesn't have any wrong answers that are just totally stupid. It has wrong answers that are still in the domains of knowledge you should know. So you should understand every term on the page. And if you don't, you should stop and study it. So I think my first day I would do like 20 questions. It would take me like two hours. So I would have to stop and Google every question. And then by the, after on the fourth day, I was just zipping through hundred tests in like a half hour, hundred questions in a half hour. Cause I knew it. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, sorry, but, yeah. um, 125 is not well I just tried it here and it works uh, let's let's go back and, uh, 125 thing. is not published um, perhaps you're, you're talking about the city college canvas server but no, 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 no. okay yeah everything else is published except for 125 and 126. uh well let's take a look um, I thought I just tried it here. So let's see if we can understand. I go here, and now if I go here and enroll, okay, but then you, after you enroll, you still can't get in? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm enrolled in your other classes, but just yeah. not the point. She's in. Yes, yeah, right. No, no, not in. No, it's not in, but I could. Oh, you're not in? It's not published or something. Not published, yeah. All right, here, let me take a look and see I mean, if I can. You can subscribe it. Can All subscribe. right, thank you for telling me. Let me see. I should be able to fix it right away. Um, right here. That is probably means I forgot to publish it. That'll do it. Let's, all right, here it is. And by George, you're right. Okay, thank you. And then uh, 127. All right, let me do that too. Good, I'm glad you told me. There's always something. By George, quite correct. Okay, they should be up now. Thank you. Good. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, I have a general yeah. question. Yeah. For like, um, I am noticing, uh, I just upgraded to Catalina and I'm a Mac user, yeah. but um, I, I'm noticing that some of the software is not working um, because like, I guess they, they can't, like Apple can't check the software for malicious, that's the- Oh, no, yeah, that's, well, there's two things. The first place is no longer support 32-bit code. So some are actually just broken. The other thing though is it made it harder to approve uh, untrusted publishers. Uh, but what my friend showed me is you have to right click on it and open, and then it'll give you a chance to approve it. They used to be right there in private in like security. You could say, let everything in, whether trusted or not. Now you can't do that on a blanket case. You have to do it case by case. So right click the app and open, and then it will give you a box saying, are you sure you want to open this nasty untrusted app? And you can say yes. Uh, yeah, no, the Splunk and Flutter thing for. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, took, I had to do it three times for Gidra. And give me so it's uh, it's pretty annoying. All right, let's see. I should check. I guess it would tell me if I had any chat coming in. All right, good. Anyway, all right. So there's one last thing I'm going to show you. Then um, I made. I went to a conference, and they had like a five minute presentation at lunch, and you can explain what the, the uh, what your class is. So I'm going to stop this.